We're going to look at uh, design arguments, the fine-tuning argument, uh, which there have been a number of which given throughout history, um, with the most famous and most rigorous and famous is the banana argument. It's very well made for the human hand, etc. cetera. Um, therefore, God exists, top notch. Uh, up next, we have the Earth being a little bit closer to the sun, we'd burn up. Why aren't we all like Icarus and having us faces melted off? Um, that's pretty neat. We're in the Goldilocks zone, etc. cetera. Um, then we have William Lane Craig. He gives a deductive form. Uh, OK, it's either these fine-tuning parameters, either necessity, chance, or design, but it's best explained by design. And what I think is probably the best, um, even though it's tiny brain on the slide, <laughs> is uh, Luke Barnes' version. Um, that's like, OK, fine-tuning isn't as improbable on um, theism as it is on like naturalistic single-universe atheism. Um, so that's a reason to prefer theism. And after this week, we saw a little, maybe some of you saw some uh, eclipse arguments to the existence of God. Um, you know, favorite YouTuber, Cameron Bruce Hussey, et cetera. Um, that was beauty, not fine-tuning. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 that's true. Um, but, but OK, so you know, the moon is like just the right size so that we can see the sun. You know, that's fine-tuned. But it's like because it's beautiful, blah, blah, whatever. OK, good stuff. We're going to talk about Luke Barnes here. Um, so this is like a really good resource is his book with Durant Lewis. Uh, it's a Christian and atheist writing together on the problem of fine tuning. So over the past 40 years, a scientist have uncovered a lot of evidence that like if you just change the properties of the universe just a little bit, um, life would be basically impossible. So they kind of survey a lot of the scientific evidence and they engage with some of the philosophical issues at play here and they compare like these and versus multiverse at least in the last, last chapter. Um, so it's a nice little tag team approach and the last chapter is like a nice little dialogue. Anyway, so I recommend that. Um, it's a really good book. So what do we mean when, we, when I say fine tuning? Short version is uh, the subset of like, life permitting universes is like tiny compared to the set of possible universes. So you know, these are definitions given by Luke Barnes, John Leslie, and um, Robin Collins. So it basically just looks as if if you change the universe's basic features just a little bit, life would not be able to evolve at all. And I will note that just accepting that the universe is fine-tuned just is to say that the life-permitting subset is like tiny. It isn't <laughs> saying that it's designed already. That's not like built into the definition or anything like that. Um, so we are going to give an argument from fine-tuning to a designer, but it's not like built into the definition of fine-tuning or anything like that, just to clarify. So we're going to go through a few steps. We look at um, how our universe does, in fact, allow for life, um, what exactly makes it fine-tuned, why it calls for explanation, and why the, I think the best explanation is, in fact, a cosmic fine-tuner, namely God. We're going to do this from a probabilistic perspective. So this is a conditional probability with that vertical line there. So how probable is some piece of evidence um, conditional on or given some theory and then some background information. So in this case, um, we have the evidence in question is that there is a life permitting universe. The theories that we're comparing are theism and naturalism. And then the background information that we're going to be looking at um, is kind of like mostly fundamental physics we're going to be um, considering here. So this is kind of the most relevant. And this is going to give us some number between 0 and 1. Um, this is kind of how we're framing it. And then the structure of the actual argument is based on Luke Barnes' formulation using like kind of a Bayesian approach. It's the probabilistic approach. He's an astrophysicist and cosmologist over in Australia, has a dope accent. Highly recommend listening to him um, for that reason alone, if nothing else. So for two theories, uh, T1 and T2, in the context of some background knowledge B, so if, you, if it's true for, of some piece of evidence, that the probability of that evidence on theory one and some background is much greater than the probability of that evidence on um, given theory two and the background, then that implies that um, that is that the evidence strongly favors theory one over theory two. 
So in this case, it's the probability of a life permitting universe given theism in some background. If that's much greater than the probability of the life permitting universe on naturalism in the background, then the evidence strongly favors theism over naturalism. Well, it turns out that the likelihood is super tiny, vanishingly small on naturalism. This is what we will see here, um, but it's not that incredibly tiny on theism. And so that implies that the existence of a life permitting universe uh, strongly confirms or favors theism over naturalism. That is the general, general structure. Make sense? Cool, sounds good. So what should be not terribly controversial is, you know, we exist, so our universe permits our existence. I feel like that's a pretty solid inference um, or like piece of evidence. Um, our universe allows for the existence of conscious embodied moral agents. And I think we can agree on that. I will go ahead and you have something to say? That's what I thought. All right. so. <laughs> Um, I'll go ahead and respond to one objection that comes up is it's like, oh, if we change the parameters, it's just like maybe life as we know it doesn't show up, but maybe a different type of life can. And it's like, yeah, sure, necessary conditions for life may be controversial and all that. We can point to some things we know are alive, uh, like this beautiful, cute baby seal, um, humans are alive, koalas, et cetera. So I think we're pretty solid there. Yeah, there's some debatable things here, viruses, uh, that creature. <laughs> um, you know, the seals in that picture or whatever, they're definitely good, but Michael, you know, I don't know. No, Michael's great, he's cool, okay. Um, so that's, you know, there's some, there's some edge cases. Um, but I think we can agree that like empty space isn't alive, hydrogen's not alive, and helium is not alive. Um, and I don't think we need to come up with necessary and sufficient conditions for living things to say that like a universe that like doesn't contain anything or only contains hydrogen and helium doesn't contain living things and would not be life permitting. So, this, so the fine tuning argument I'm gonna be working with doesn't really hinge on having like these strict definitions of what makes a living thing. Okay, just wanted to clarify that. So now we're gonna look at the actual tuning um, and what the conditions are for what could allow for life. In order to do that, we need to talk about like what kinds of constants are relevant here. And so some standards for looking at like what kind of constants we're interested in. First of all, we're interested in the most fundamental constants for like our cosmic fine tuning, um, not derived constants. So these would be constants in our most basic theories of physics. So general relativity, quantum mechanics, standard model of particle physics and cosmology, things like that. Um, and so it can't be calculated based on deeper physics. So this wouldn't be things like, you know, the elasticity of like some metal or viscosity of water, like these things can at least in principle and sometimes in practice be calculated um, just based on more fundamental laws and constants, things like that. So these things um, are kind of free floating, meaning you, know, you can change them, the theory works perfectly fine with any range of them, nothing like kind of breaks down. So you'd have to just go out into the world and like measure them, you know, like masses of elementary particles are commonly this type of free floating fundamental constant, speed of light, things like that. So those are kind of the constants we're going to be looking at and are not, not able to be explained by other things. So they make the best case. And if either the constant should be dimensionless or like normalizable to be dimensionless, um, because we don't, so it's not like really the quantitative values of these parameters that matter so much. If you write the speed of light, you can write it as like a really big number, you know, 300 million meters per second. You can write it as a small number. Probably the most useless way to say it is one light year per year. Uh, that's very uninformative, but um, you know, so. There's like different ways of writing it and you want to kind of have it be not, not arbitrary um, or at least be normalized to any, any dimensional constant you can put it into a dimensionless form. So it's not really like that, 
that much of a, a thing. Um, so f the ratio of two masses is going to be dimensionless. Um, so it's, it doesn't have units of meters. I think one of the examples is like football fields per whatever. OK. So fundamental dimensionless numbers are the best. I wanted to introduce this other concept that's a bit more technical and difficult in particle physics that they talk about, which is naturalness. So naturalness is about, this is going to help inform our probability distribution. Um, and that's why I'm talking about it. So naturalness is about how a parameter changes with energy scale. So a parameter might be one value if you're looking at like, you know, very low energy regions versus high energy regions. So high energy, like a particle accelerator is a very high energy um, context. You know, you have to accelerate those things at massively, you know, like substantial fractions of the speed of light and collide them. You get a lot of energy versus like the average energy contained in like the universe. You know, think of the 2.7 Kelvin. There's like not a whole lot of energy relative in that. Uh, it's like negative 454 degrees Fahrenheit. And the parameters might like change whenever you're considering what energy scales. So what physicists do is they create effective theories, effective field theories more specifically, to look at how um, the parameters of function of like energy scale. So to create a map of sorts from high energy to low energy behavior. From this mapping, then we can distinguish between two different types of parameters, uh, a natural and unnatural parameters. So the first type is an unnatural parameter. It's one that is extremely sensitive to its high energy value. So what physicists do is they, they pick values. Like this is kind of where physicists play around um, in the high energy region. And they kind of look at the behavior in the low energy region because it needs to be like well behaved. Um, so, a natural, so an unnatural parameter is one that if I just change, change the value at the high energy region just a tiny amount, then it can get wildly different behavior in the low energy region. So there's like not much variation in here. Um, I only changed it by 0 0.001. This is kind of a, a model example, um, like some constant, like the cosmological constant, whatever. And you get very different behavior over here. You get a huge divergence to positive infinity if you just increase it by 0 0.001 versus flat versus diver, you know, going to negative infinity. So there's a great sensitivity here. Um, and so that tells you that the, lower, the prior probability distribution is going to be a lot like um, a lot lower. And you know, we can talk some more details if you want to. Yeah, yes. So my understanding was that parameters were things like constants, like the speed of light, right? Yeah, so this is not a variation in like time or space, really. Um, it's not like if I go like way far away in the universe, it's a different value. It's kind of a different way of thinking about it, like, um, yeah, it's like, uh, I, I don't know a way to phrase it other than basically what, what they do is they, you know, this is, it's called renormalization group flow to, they, they look at, they create, construct a high energy model to model what's going on in high energy contexts. And then that same theory is like, um, basically you can construct a function um, that shows what the value of that parameter is in like low energy situations. And that's, uh, yeah. I don't feel like I could do anything to possibly change the value of the speed of light, for instance. It doesn't matter what energy I'm operating at. Is that right? Um, yeah. No, you cannot. Okay. Yeah. I'm not allowed. Right. But there are other parameters where physicists working in different fields are using different values? Um, yes, that is right. So difference. fine structure constant, for example, is, I'm trying to think. I think it goes, I think, if I remember correctly, like particle, so particle physics is considered high energy physics. Condensed matter physics is like low energy physics. Um, and 
fine structure constant for low inner, for condensed matter is always one over, I think, okay, I think it's 137. It might be 117, but I think it's one over 137. Um, and I think particle physics is more like one over 120 something. Um, so they end up with, so yeah, so you can end up with different scenarios depending on what kind of situation you're dealing with. Okay, sorry to pause off, we can move on. Sounds, sounds good. So, so if on the other hand, like the parameter, you can, you can pick a wide variety on this end of the spectrum and you end up with like the same value over here, it all ends in zero, for example, then it's not very sensitive. And so the prior probability isn't gonna be like as high. So that's kind of the, the gist. Um, I mean, more specifically, an unnatural parameter uses a uniform prior probability. Natural parameter uses a log uniform. And, but we can, I can explain more later if someone cares. Okay, so normalization problem. Um, so this is a problem that comes up whenever you talk about prior probabilities and you have these constants that look like, you know, there's not like, looks like you can, can kind of do whatever you want with them, but in, in reality, like you need the probability system to one. If I flip a coin, I can't say that there's like 50% chance it'll land on heads, 50% tails, and then 50% it lands on its side. You don't have a total probability outcome of like more than one. That's just non-physical. So you, whatever you end up doing, you need to make sure the probability sum to one. So what that amounts to, if you have some parameter, some parameter X goes from zero to 10, and you have some probability density, um, then in order to get the probability, you just kind of take the area under the curve. So you like sum up all of the rectangular chunks if you take calculus, whatever, um, and you end up with like the total probability. And then as long as you have finite bounds, it's gonna be some finite number in, let's say, then you can just divide by n and um, the total probability sums to one. So then your new probability distribution. Anyway, so you can just easily make sure that you have a probability that sums to one if the bounds are finite. If the bounds are infinite and your parameter can just go on forever, then now you have like infinities and for any given region, if you have an anthropic region, doesn't matter what size it is, the probability of it's zero because the, the total possibility is infinite. Um, so, if the mass, and we can think like there's no logical, like it's, there's no just like, you know, a priori knowledge that the mass of an electron has to be finite, right? So, so at first glance, we might think that these parameters can just go off to infinity, and now our fine tuning argument is in the dumpster because um, the probability of any of this stuff is zero, whether it's life permitting, not life permitting, whatever. And that's, bad, or it, or it goes to over one, um, you know. So what do we do? Uh, depends on what kind of constant we have. So the problem comes from the, the combination of infinite bounds and a principle of indifference. The principle of indifference meaning, you know, we don't care what it is, it's the same probability, which corresponds to a flat distribution across all possibilities. So it's the combination of those two that gets you off to infinity. Um, so in order to solve that, we have to reject whoop, we have to reject one or both of these, depending on the constant type uh, fixes which or possibly both that you'll end up doing. If you have a dimensional constant, then we can motivate like bounds. If you have a dimensionless constant, we can reject the principle of indifference because we expect these to be around the probability of one. And you can ask me more about why that is. But since we're going to be focusing on dimensional constants here, then that will be normalized, then um, yeah, we're gonna talk about this. So in order to reject this infinite to infinity and beyond possibility, then we need to bring it into what our physical theories are telling us the max limits are on these parameters. So in reality, you can't have like an infinite mass. Um, if you have a mass beyond like the Planck mass, for example, then you get like, infinities and your theories break and you know that's saying the particle becomes a black hole and like that's not good physics that happens so we say our you know whatever whatever the dimension is 
um, whatever the units are, it's bounded by whatever the, the Planck scale is. That's where like we have to have new physics to figure out what's going on and our theories are broken. So this is how we kind of limit the range of what the constants can be is we have this physically motivated maximum and minimum. So if, as long as we do that, then it's normalizable and it's fine. We have finite probability and everybody can go home happy. So this is, that's how we ensure that the probability is finite. All right. Is everybody reasonably happy with this? All right, cool. So here's two of probably the, who here are probably the two most solid cases in fine tuning. They've, a lot of work has been put into investigating them and they're probably the most solid cases. They are unnatural parameters. So you get those wild variations um, that have the, the lowest probability distribution. They are dimensional. So we need to normalize by the corresponding like Planck units to um, like rescale them. So the cosmological, yes. We want unnatural constants. Those make the strongest case. You, Those. Want, it, you want it to be divergent as you go to the low Small energy. Small changes in the low, the low in energy. The high energy. In the high energy case result. Yes. We want the case where just change it a little bit, and then all of a sudden it's but yeah. I thought that that meant that if it's unnatural, then it also means that physicists don't even agree on what the value is. Well, so. Or they do agree on what the value is at, a, at any given energy. So, oh yeah. So there is there is a fixed value. I guess I I guess there's actually a much easier answer to your question earlier, which is like this is them testing out theory the values that are different than the actual one. <laughs> um, so like. You mean they do that on the models? So yeah, like yeah, models yeah. Show right. Okay. Yeah. So. The parameters are supposed to be constants, um, and then depending on the model, you can tweak it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The Let's variation see. is not reflective of reality. The variation is 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 testing. Yes, it's testing grounds for the theories. Yeah. So they say. You know, our theories are perfectly fine if we plug in x or x plus 2. Let's plug in x plus 2. Let's do some calculations, see what the universe looks like. Wow, that's a terrible universe. Glad we don't live in that one. So that's the, that's the gist of it. Okay, cosmological constants, the first one. So this is about the expansion of the universe, the dark energy density, the force of anti-gravity that's pushing us you know, to, to keep expanding. Um, and it's very tiny, fortunately, fortunately for us. Um, you know, as, as luck would have it or whatever. Um, so otherwise, um, yeah, it would have stopped galaxies and stars from forming. Cosmic evolution would have been stifled before it could even begin. So this book kind of surveys a little bit about it. Um, this was discovered just in 1998. So this is like um, pretty, pretty cool new, new thing that has been found. Um, and lots of testing has shown that it's a persistent problem quite a bit. Um, so this constant has reflected in the dark energy density. Uh, that's what the row is. Like it's uh, reflected in dark energy density. And this is normalized by the Planck scale. Um, so the, the plot here is not normalized, so that's why it's like around negative 120, 10 to the minus 120. So beyond this, uh, you no longer have like interesting, um, you know, cosmic structure. Um, you will have, you know, it'll start expanding way too fast and atoms, you know, nuclei can't really enlarge at all because um, everything's just kind of gradually getting more and more apart. So you end up with some dilute helium and hydrogen soup, which is, uh, as I think as we agreed, not living. So you would not have a life permitting universe if this um, value was any greater than 0, 0.000 with 90 zeros with a one. Um, so that's pretty tiny. 
And it's the same thing on the other end. If it was any, if it was too um, large in the negative end of the spectrum, then it would be too strong of a gravitational force, and it would recollapse in on itself after one second. So you would not, um, you would end up in a singularity once again, and you would not have any large scale like cosmic structure. So you wouldn't have any life whatsoever. Um, that would be another boring universe. So applying a uniform um, probability distribution between the Planck limits, then this likelihood turns out to be um, of a life permitting value of the constant, 10 to the negative 90th power. Pretty small, uh, pretty, pretty impressive. The second case is with the Higgs vacuum expectation value. And this one we normalize by the Planck mass. So this, this has to do with like the Higgs fields and how different particles couple to it and different things like that, yes. I believe he's dead now. That's true. He died yesterday, he just, today. He died. Yesterday at the age of 94. Yeah. yeah. Sad day. Um, so, so again, we, this one is also normalized um, by the Planck mass in this case. So if it was any less than this really tiny value of 10 to the negative 35th, then hydrogen cannot uh, capture electrons. So you will not have stars. You can't have the main like nuclear uh, reaction. Stars are the main source of like heavier elements beyond hydrogen and helium. So a pretty boring universe um, again. And if it was any greater than 10 to the minus 33, then you don't have any bound nuclei whatsoever. So no chemistry, no carbon, no silicon, no, no, nothing, nothing much of anything. No more periodic table. Pretty boring universe. Um, definitely not living, living things in it. So you do the same type of uh, uniform distribution. You get a value of 10 to the negative 33 for a, a likelihood of a life permitting universe. So that's again, pretty tiny. So I do not, in fact, have formal training in cosmology or astrophysics specifically. Um, so why should you listen to me? Well, uh, that is correct. I do not. I have some training in physics, but not astrophysics or uh, cosmology. But I did get to hang out with some people who did for a while. Um, last summer, I went to Rutgers for three weeks for uh, fine-tuning summer school where I got to hang out with a lot of the experts in those fields and variety of fields. Um, and they actually paid me to do it too, so it was a pretty pretty good gig. Um, so a lot of people who have published in fine-tuning. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, nope, that is someone else. Actually, Aaron and Luke had left by this picture, and I didn't want, well, anyway, this was the most normal looking picture, so I just included this one. <laughs> but um, yeah, so Luke was there, Aaron was there, they were both there for a while. Um, Aaron is the one who introduced all of the naturalness and, and particle physics stuff, and there were some interesting like kind of debates between him and Luke on some stuff, so that was cool. Robin Collins was there, uh, Hans Halverson, Neil Manson, you have Isaacs, John Hawthorne. These people have all published on fine tuning, and uh, so we got to read lots of papers and argue about them, and it was great. Okay. So hopefully I know more than zero. Um, and or you can just think of like there is a pretty general consensus. Um, I'm not going to say universal, but like a, a lot of the uh, majority of um, relevant experts um, in physics, particle physics, do agree that the universe is actually fine tuned. Um, the sub subspace of life permitting universes are it's like super tiny. And these people have like very different backgrounds. You know, they're not just, they're not all theists. Probably really a small fraction of them are just, if you just based on like, anyway, like the general probability of scientists being Christians and blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, then, and they're also kind of appealing to maybe somewhat strange explanations that at first glance are like, huh, that sounds, pretty whack. They must have like something that they're really, there must be a hard problem that they're trying to solve, you know? Um, and so 
given that, like, I think that suggests that there's, there's definitely something going on. Um, you know, maybe there's something to say about, like, let's just make up, you know, crazy ideas to get published and stuff. But I think there's a little bit more to that given, like, how much, um, how much is going on in, in physics talk about this. And I guess one little quick note is that um, if you if you want to appeal to like scientific consensus for like this area, then you probably should be consistent or at least have really carefully thought out principled reasons for distinguishing them. But um, probably should be consistent if you want to like appeal to skepticism about evolution or like whatever controversial things. If you if you're in that boat. Okay, so cosmologists, astrophysicists agree that the universe is fine-tuned. Uh, this is like a real thing that kind of. Uh, calls for explanation. So we're going to talk about the need for explanation and how how this can, um, what this looks like on naturalism. So we've shown that from physics, like the probability of a life from any universe is rather tiny, and naturalism doesn't tell us like anything else um, beyond like physics. Like naturalism is generally like let's look at our best physics and see what it has to say. Um, so naturalism naturalism doesn't like add anything to that information about what the, what the probability distributions would look like. So we can just use those probability distributions from physics and plug them into naturalism to see what we get. And we get something that is the probabilities that I just shared, which are you know super tiny. So when we combine the two examples, um, the probability of a life from any universe given naturalism and then the cosmological constant specifically is less than 10 to the, um, yeah, 10 to the negative 90th. And whereas with the Higgs expectation value, 10 to the negative 33. Combine that, you know, those are independent. So the probability of a life from any universe on naturalism um, and with the background is less than 10 to the negative 123. And that looks not super great um, for them. So, but we need to make sure, like, we better have a better like theory. You know, it could be that our other theory is negative 130. So we want to make sure we look at that. And that's well, that's a lot of zeros um, if you can see that. So now we're going to focus on the probability on theism and try to show that it's not vanishingly small as it is on naturalism. So in comparing with naturalism, what's the probability that if God exists and created a universe, that God would end up creating a specifically life-permitting one? So what is this probability? Um, well, I think we have good reason to think that the probability of a life-permitting universe if on theism is much larger than um, 10 to the negative 123. So one, I guess one general understanding about theism is that what theism adds that naturalism does not have is intentions and intentionality. That's the main thing. So, um, and then God also on like standard theories, he's all powerful. So he's capable of realizing any of his intentions. So when you put those together, then, um, then you end up with like realize, realizable situations of what God wants. Now, what does God want? Well, on standard theism, God is good. Um, also, it comes from our background knowledge that embodied moral agents, consciousness, self-awareness, like these types of things are good. You know, free will, moral responsibility, the kind of um, universe where, where people um, can engage in um, lifelong projects and more responsible behavior, et cetera. Like these are all good things. Um, so this makes us think that God is going to have some reason to create um, a life preventing universe where there are these embodied moral agents. Second thing is that God is a person and, or at least personal, um, if in fact those can be distinguished. So God is going to be interested in relationships with other persons. Persons are inherently like, you know, relational and social in nature. Um, so he's going to be interested in relationships with other persons. And so that gives God some reason to promote the existence of persons and which would, which would require life of the sort that would have um, embodied moral agents. So I think these two, I guess these three factors suggest that um, it's not terribly unlikely that God would create. Even if you think 
I guess first you can consider like more weird versions of theism. Like maybe God like really likes stars specifically and wants to create stars or really likes tungsten or any other like random element or whatever. Like it's still true that because of the situation we just described, most of the non-life permitting universes don't have like any interesting chemistry. They don't have tungsten, they don't have stars. So it still turns out the probability of a life permitting universe on like even weird versions of theism is still vastly more probable than like on naturalism. Even if we consider less than that, like it's, we, we wouldn't even be able um, to come up with like 10 to the 123rd reasons if we only think one of those is correct or something um, that are like remotely plausible for God to create. So like the probability isn't going to end up being like much less than negative uh, or 10 to the minus 123. So I think we have good reason to suggest that theism uh, has a higher probability, may, raises the probability of a life permitting universe relative to naturalism. Okay, this is kind of a kind of a, a, a model to see what the probability distribution might change as a result of um, when you factor this stuff in. So this is just kind of a, a way of thinking about it. So consider some parameter, let's say it varies from zero to 100, the anthropic range is from 25 to 50. Then we assign like a uniform probability distribution as we have been doing. Um, and then we have like that anthropic range. And then we, we think about what the, what the probability would look like um, it's going to turn out to just be the number of possible life permitting universes divided by the total of total number of possible universes, which in this case is just one fourth of the the possible landscape is life permitting. I guess this is assuming naturalistic single universe atheism, I'm using atheism as a shorthand for that. Um, whereas theism, on the other hand, looks a little different. It kind of shifts the probability. Um, so what I mean is you have this probability density function, then it's going to kind of smush the probability into the anthropic range. Like that's kind of what would be like the way to think about when you add intentions, when you add a desire for like life, um, for relationships, for moral goodness, uh, then it's going to squish that probability. So it's like focused more so in the anthropic range. And what this can amount to is this multiplicative factor of the probability. I just call it the life interest factor that arises from God being personal and good. So he has these like interests, desires in um, promoting the creation of life for embodied moral agents. So this is kind of, you know, I didn't draw this not exactly symmetrical standard distribution there, but I tried my best. Um, but this is, this is like how to think about it. Um, so if this life interest factor is much greater than one, then the probability of life permitting universe on theism is much greater than on atheism. Yes, David. Does the idea of God being a necessary being factor into like the idea of possible universes at all? Is that mess with the math in any way, or is it just kind of not really real? Hmm, that's a good question. I would think like if God, let's see, because mapping between possible worlds and universes isn't always straightforward, but if God is like super contingent and that like he wouldn't exist in some of these other possible worlds, it depends on which worlds that we would think. So if we're going to say that God is not necessary, then in order us for it to know how it affects the fine tuning argument is to know which worlds God is likely to exist in. Um, if he's like, for example, like <laughs> if he can't, if he doesn't exist, if we're going to combine like it's possible to have a universe in outside of this anthropic range, and also it's an impossible for God to exist in a where there is a universe. 
um, outside of the anthropic range, and that could like boost our probability. But that's pretty weird uh, <laughs> to say that. Um, so uh, yes, it would, I would think anyway, affect it. But coming up with figuring out what like, if we want to make it affect the probability to figure out what worlds God is likely to exist in and combine that with the view that there still would be possible universes where that like God didn't create them even though he created ours it gets pretty funky. So I think that's a good question worthy of great exploration. Does that answer it? Yeah, I just I don't know a whole lot about probability <laughs> statistics. I just figured if you were throwing in a parameter reasons about why what the nature of God would be like, surely one of those reasons would be he's necessary, which seems to interfere with dividing you know, possible versus yeah. yeah. I think yeah, I think on the standard assumption that he you know he's necessary, then um, I don't think like adding that information alone, like apart from his goodness and personality would affect the probability. Um, if you add like contingency in a way that's not uniform across this probability, then it would change it. That's my, that's my thought, but I haven't thought about that before. So good thought. Okay. So here's some objections. Um, so Multiverse, that's a thing people, people bring up, physicists bring up frequently. Um, how about that? I mean, surely in multiverse, yeah, I mean, there's, there's going to be a life permitting universe somewhere in there. And, you know, if then you add the anthropic explanation, you know, obviously we wouldn't be in the one where there isn't observers, where there isn't moral agents. Um, okay, yeah, so if you're going to appeal to multiverse, then there's a whole bunch of problems that come alongside it. So this is called the measure problem in, in physics and cosmology, is that our probabilities just kind of completely go down the drain um, if we have an infinite multiverse. Because anything that'll happen, that can happen will happen, and will happen an infinite number of times. Or there's different ways of like cashing that out. How do we calculate um, what proportion of universes are, because we saw this with the normalization problem, what proportion of universes are going to be life permitting if there is like an infinite number? And so there's different approaches you can try to take, different, like what's called regularization, and you can, you know, you appeal to like some subset and then you kind of incrementally expand outward. There's, there's a lot of issues and, and problems with like all of the attempts um, to do this. So, you know, if you have the solution to that, then um, maybe we can make it work, but as of right now, there's not really anything close to a satisfying one. So you can't really do any type of like, yeah, like you can't say that the probability um, doing this distribution is, is uh, there's, not, there's not really a good way of doing it in, in with a multiverse. So the other thing is, um, like, yeah, sure, um, fine tuning counts as evidence of a multiverse, but only in the same way that like that chair counts as an evidence of a multiverse, there's much more likely to be a chair if there's a lot more universes than just on one universe. You know, so then it's just everything becomes trivially evidence of a multiverse because if you have more chances, uh, there's just more chance that something's gonna happen. Um, than if you only have one thing happening. So, um, so this is like kind of a genuine issue and it's hard to get through. Um, so this is, a, this is a paper that kind of explores some of the issues at play here. This is called self-locating evidence. And there's different proposals on like, what do you do with this, with the kind of evidence that um, like makes inference to a multiverse and it gets really technical, and there's also similarly problems with like each view, including the ones that avoid like in evidential inferences to the multiverse. So I think they're kind of um, there's definitely yeah basically like 
our epistemology again goes in the garbage if we're going to say fine tuning argument is like fine tuning is really good evidence of a multiverse. And you can think of this is what Luke Barnes calls like his uh, awesome theological argument. So if you consider the case where you know the stars or something spells out in the sky like the first for 14 verses or 16 verses of John in Greek. Um, if your theory doesn't say that that is evidence of God's existence, then you have a garbage theory because obviously that is evidence of God's existence. Um, and the multiverse, it seems hard to even make that happen. And so that makes it not like a good theory. So this is another kind of um, manner of reasoning that Luke's given that I think is, uh, I think is quite nice. Um, depending on your multiverse model, so like eternal inflation is kind of one approach, then at least some of these just end up pushing back fine tuning a step. Um, you have to like, for example, if you have inflation, then you have to make sure it doesn't inflate for like too long. This is a period of like very rapid expansion. This is proposed to help explain some of the other problems like flatness and things like that. If it's you know, this this was called, I think they have figured this one out specifically called the graceful exit problem, that it has to stop inflating and it has to become more normal. Like we're currently expanding and not like an in inflation period because um, that would really stretch things out way too fast. It was like 80 orders of magnitude in like, I don't know, a second or something like that. Or uh, yeah, so it was, anyway, so, to make sure that's done correctly in a way that results in a life permitting universe, again, requires some fine tuning. So it doesn't look like you can really get around it in like a plausible, convincing way um, with a multiverse. Another case, uh, we have Audrey here taking center stage. So consider an anthropic reasoning. Let's say Audrey goes um, fishing in Lake Bryan and she caught 50 different fish and they were all over one foot long. And she made an inference from this while she was packing up her foot long mesh net that all of the fish in Lake Bryan were over a foot long. So is Audrey correct in her inference? Um, what do you think? Is this a good inference? Yes. Yes, Sam shaking his head no. I think the answer is no. And so we're going to consider the firing squad. So Audrey is incorrect. Um, and so therefore, she is going to be subject to a firing squad, <laughs> which is a very fair <laughs> and reasonable thing to do. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Audrey. So, you, so she goes before. Um, so you have you know, 15, 20, 100, doesn't matter, 20 marksmen that are like trained, and they all kind of you know, uh, aim at this person, and then three, two, one, boom. And she's like, wakes up, or she doesn't wake up. She just opens her eyes and is like, oh, I'm fine. Um, well, you know, it's not surprising I'm alive because if I weren't alive, then I wouldn't be here to see it. So like, it's fine, nothing, nothing, nothing weird happened at all. Um, because, yeah, if I were dead, I, I couldn't observe it. Now, is that, is that a good inference? I think, I think no. I think we should um, question that and, and think about what else might have happened and consider alternative explanations, such as they were firing blanks or they're, you know, they were intentionally missed because they didn't want to shoot her for probably not a very good reason for <laughs> subjecting her to that in the first place, etc. So there's probably other better explanations. Um, so yeah, so this type of anthropic reasoning, I think, can be a bit, a bit um, dubious and doesn't actually answer like the question. You know, there's, there's other candidate examples um, like why you know, why does a plane get pressurized at one atmosphere? Um, well, you know, it's because like I'd be dead if it, if it wouldn't. Like that's why I observe. And that's also like not a good explanation. There's, you know, pumps and all that stuff. And then, then why, why do they pump in one atmosphere? Well, it's because like, you know, then there is something about like, well, I wouldn't be able to survive. But 
that is exactly the point. That's why they were designed that way. And so then you end up in like a design inference anyway. So yeah, I don't think this is a good objection. Um, another thing. Yes. Is the argument here, OK, so with the fish, the argument is, obviously, all the fish that she catches are longer than a foot. Is anything longer than a foot's going to swim? Anything to shorter than a foot. Right. Yeah. Anything smaller than a foot. And so the argument is, the reason we see a fine-tuned universe is because we could not observe the fine-tuned universe. It's not like we can wake up in hydrogen world. Right. right? Or, or yes. Like yeah. And so it's saying that. Anything that we see, even if it seems surprising, it shouldn't be surprising because if it didn't happen, we wouldn't see it. So the probability of it happening is one. Right, yes. Okay. Which is lame. Yes. And hopefully I have helped convince you. So of that. if uh, sorry, if the fish is a is a bat is sorry, is an example where the the bias is at play in the fish example. And the firing squad is an example of why the why the bias isn't at play. Um, how do we know which is which? Well, like it's at play if you infer if you infer that like if you make the same inference about um, well I couldn't have observed otherwise. Okay. Or, you know. Some kind of mechanism, I guess. Has yeah. To be at play for yeah. Well, you need you need a selection effect. Selection effect. Like so, like if you combine this with the multiverse, then it might work. Right. right. Okay. So if, if there are a squat billion universes and, <laughs> and, we, and we are in the one, but we only, naturally, we're only going to be living in the ones that can support us. Okay. Yes. Yes. Put it another way, like, if, if the net of death comes over us, obviously we're the small fish or whatever, right? Yeah. yeah. But you, you can't, you, but you can't, you, you can't, you have to have both of them, right? Yeah. Yeah, the combination of the two is probably pretty reasonable. You know, there are some objections, like the this universe objection, you know, and then there's, there's been a lot of back and forth, and I'm not sure that's convincing. So, okay, so maybe we don't have a theory of everything, um, but when we do, that's going to get rid of it, right? Um, I, don't think, I don't think so. Um, I think everything that we look at doesn't, you know, suggest, suggest that's not the case. So we can look at the cosmological constant some more. Or we look at different proposals, like different dark energy proposals. They kind of all have these like weird cancellation and, and orders of magnitude that's very surprising. Um, cosmological constant isn't zero. Zero is like a nice number that might be explained by symmetry. Um, there is some aspect, like supersymmetry can, can um, cancel out some of them. So the order of magnitude is 10 to the negative 53. Um, instead of 10 to the negative 90th, this is this is if you have supersymmetry, but you know searches for support for supersymmetry have not been very um, compelling thus far. So, but that's a possible help. Um, but it's not completely solvable. It's also not solvable by quantum gravity because instead of just at the high energies, you can also get the problem at low energies. So, um, or at lower energies, and. So, and we continue to discover more and more fine tuning. People are still like publishing papers about it all the time, like, um, you know, finding, finding in, inter, interdependent effects and, you know, the cosmological constants, even a recent thing. So it doesn't really look like this is going away. And, you know, in theory, I'm happy to say that we might need to update on our evidence in the future. But um, until then, I think we're pretty solid. OK, what about if we want to be a weird atheist, perhaps like Philip Goff is? Um, so if theists say, we're going to add this hypothesis, God likes life, then I can say that too as a naturalist. So one version of this, axiarchism, says things exist because it's good for that they exist. Um, that's why the universe exists. And um, sounds pretty cool, a little bit weird, but cool. Um, so. I think there's two things. Well, it's good that God exists. So if it's good for, you know, if things exist, if they're good, then like God exists. Okay, so we're still theists if we're axiarchists. Um, another thing is like theism can just explain why axiarchism is even true in the first place. Uh, like why would it be that things exist? Well, God can bring about good things and that's why they would, they would exist. So that's, 
that's kind of, it's just like a deeper explanation of and a better version of axiochism. So if you like that, then just be a theist anyway. So yeah, that's, that's the gist of it. Here's some recommendations. Luke Barnes with the double whammy and, um, and the more physics-y thing at the end. So yeah, thank you.